All right, welcome everyone as we celebrate the week of the young child with this Lunch and Learn Echo titled Educate, Elevate, and Celebrate. Today is the second in our series of five webinars this week, and Cheryl Huffy will be presenting on Babies in Brains, Some Assembly Required. I am Kate Barlow. I am the CDC's Act Early Ambassador for the state of Massachusetts, and I will be today's host. Thank you so much, Cheryl, for volunteering your time and sharing your expertise with us. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited. The sun is out. We just had an eclipse yesterday. And I have an excuse to put lipstick on. So I'm super excited. When you work from home, it doesn't always happen. Um, I do know, I know Paula. I want to shout out to Paula. Hi, Paula. Um, so my, um, just a little background. My full-time job is I am the program director at Fisher College. I oversee the early childhood department. Easy Ed to Go is a side gig because we all know early childhood feeds your soul, not your wallet, right? And then also I am um, I am the president elect for Macy, the national, uh, we're the affiliate for NAEYC. So Week in the Young Child is uh, near and dear um, and I'm super excited to get started. This is uh, like um, Kate had said, babies and brains. So it's brain development made fun didn't think that was possible right so it's um it's a lot we're down and dirty for an hour so if you want me to stop ask any questions or feel free I put my contact information in the chat box and you'll have it on the slide so if there's anything that you want um, more information on or um you just want to chat about things uh feel free to reach out to me all right thank you everyone and it is, um, I will say it's absolutely gorgeous out. I just went for a quick little uh, lunch walk and I'm in Rhode Island. I, I'm sure you guys are all over uh, Mass, but it is uh, in Rhode Island. It's, it's nice today. So, all right. So we are going to talk about brain development, parts of the brain and what they're responsible for. And just really quickly, um, if you want to put in the chat, how many of you work directly with infants? You can either raise your hand or you can put it in the chat. All right. So we will, uh, with that, we'll get started. And even if you don't work with infants directly, this is um, important because now you know where they've come from to where they are with you. And then if you do have infants in the future, you are going to be super prepared. All right. So this is part of a training initiative that is out of Atlanta, Georgia. It's an organization called Better Brains for Babies. I had the awesome opportunity to go down and become a train the trainer for their um, series of modules. And this one really um, resonated with me. I'm also, I'm just finishing up my um, dissertation and it is on attachment with infants and toddlers who have toxic stress. So uh, brain development is just, it's um, something I'm very, very passionate about. So to begin, we're gonna talk about the four parts of the brain, the two lobes, I mean, the two hemispheres and then the four lobes, okay? So the first part of the brain to develop is the brainstem. And the brainstem is responsible for, it's the most primitive and you almost, you have no real, a lot of control over it. Um, these are things that basically think of survival, right? So this is your breathing, your heart rate, your maintaining your normal body temperature, your digestive process. And these things happen kind of, you know, systematically, automatically. And then it's also responsible for your reflex actions. So blinking when an object comes too close to you um, or for infants, for babies, is a, it's a range of reflexes. So it could be the eye blinking, it could be sucking, rooting, grasping, all of those reflexes that if you think of for basic survival. Right? Oh, 
I guess I have to click. All right. The second part of the brain is the cerebellum. The cerebellum starts to begin. It's kind of the fleshy part that's outside of the, oh, my thing is just going too fast. Um, and cerebellum in Latin, if anyone still takes Latin, is means little brain. And the cerebellum is responsible for your basic, for your balance, movement, and coordination. The cerebellum is also responsible because it helps you. It's important because it's for um, posture and it coordinates how your muscles work together. And it also regulates the force and the steadiness in your range of movements. So as this cerebellum develops, it allows a baby to go from crawling to walking to running, right? So it coordinates their, their muscular system. The third part of the brain is this develop is the limbic system. Within the limbic system, there are two parts. There's the amygdala and the hippocampus. So the amygdala or the, I'm sorry, the we'll go back to the overall limbic system is going to control processing your emotions, okay? Now, when I was attending this, this was kind of, this was, I don't expect, it doesn't have to be everybody's, but this was my aha moment for me. Um, and so emotions such as fear, anxiety, they're processed by the limbic system, even before a child has language, right? So when we're thinking about child abuse, child neglect, um, it, this is where it's impacting. And it, it's been shown, research has shown it, it can have an impact even in utero. And that's why it's really important to uh, be aware of that and just know that these systems are processing, even though um, the child has not been born yet. So as I said, the limbic system, it's broken up into two parts, the amygdala and the hippocampus. And those two parts work together to process sensory information, okay, related to perception, memories, and emotion. So the amygdala is the part that, and this is located internally, and this is the part of the brain that processes your emotions. So if there's damage to this part of the brain, whether it's um, accidental, if it's in utero, if it's because of a disease, then if that part is damaged, this can cause a child or a person to be either um, too fearful or not fearful enough, okay? So when a, an example is if a baby's frightened, the amygdala recognizes that fear and then codes that fear and stores it, okay? So that the child has this for retrieval or an adult, right, has this for retrieval for later on in life to assist them in processing that fear, okay? So it also, um, it processes fear and anxiety even if the baby is not old enough to be conscious to have those feelings yet, okay? The second part of the limbic system is the hippocampus. So the hippocampus processes and stores emotional memories. So the amygdala store registers fear and, and other emotions while the hippocampus stores emotional memories, okay? And those two, you'll be able to see how they, how they work together. So the emotional memories that the hippocampus stores and registers is largely unconscious. And it's actually the Latin word for seahorse. So some people think it looks like a seahorse. I don't see that. But um, if anyone's familiar with those, maybe it does. So the hippocampus does three things. So it's going to process your emotional information and it coordinates those memories by three things, time, 
sense of vision, and sense of smell. So it takes those three things and it kind of stores them in like a Google folder, if you will, or in a shared drive in your, in your brain, in your limbic system to allow for retrieval of them later on. Okay. So I want you to think of a happy memory because this is in the Dr. Phil show. We're not going down negative Nelly, ne negative Nelly, Nelly uh, highway here. Right. So think of a positive memory that you have. And when you have that positive memory, uh, raise your hand, please. And then Kate, can you see who raises their hands? So most people are um, probably eating lunch and have their camera off right now. So I will just oh, wait okay. a minute. Okay, we have some hands raised. Shoot, you can randomly uh, randomly call on someone. Let's well, see. let me start then. I have a happy memory. It's the smell of my grandmother. Okay, so your, your memory is your grandmother, right? That's correct. So now I'll ask you, like, when you think of her, just a general, like, time of the day, what would that be? What would that look like? When I got to sleep, when I gonna lay down and sleeping. Okay. I just remember she near me and her smell. And remember she was uh, reading stories for me. Yep. Great. So you can see from Paula's memory that she has a sense of a vision of her grandmother. She has a, a specific smell that her grandmother had and the time of day that she's associating with that memory, right? Uh, let's see, Jackie, do you want to share your memory? Sure. Thank you, I, just, I was just trying to get my picture on. I don't know what happened to it. <laughs> you have a um, lovely red background right now. I know. I'm like, I was just trying to change it. Um, that is your color. <laughs> I'd say the birth of my child, my first child. Okay. Time of day. Um, 2.20 in the morning. Great. Um, any smells associated with that? No, not that I can. Uh, did you have I a hospital just... birth? Yes. Okay. What in a hospital did it smell like? I'd say yeah. sterile, clean. Sterile. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So you can see again, when you kind of fine tune those happy memories, you can all go back and you can pull out sense of vision, a sense of smell and time, right? So, yeah. and thank you, Jackie, for sharing. So when we look at memories, right, you need to have those three things. Sometimes one of them might be a little fuzzy, but any of your memories that you have, you can generally pull from that. So when Someone walks into a room that like, oh, this is deja vu for me. Like I've been here before. You might have, but what you're doing is part of your memory is missing one of those pieces. So you might be missing the smell or you might be missing the time of day or you might be <clears throat> missing the, the, the vision of it, right? So this also, sadly, um, and when I, so I travel all over and do this, this training generally not in an hour, but we're here, right? Is um, is that uh, in New England, it's very much uh, birth of children, um, loss of a loved one or um, weddings. Uh, sometimes I get divorces as long as it's a happy divorce. And um, a lot of ocean, um, you know, a lot of people uh, think of the ocean or a, or a picnic to the ocean or a beach trip. Um, and it also is, and I, I don't want to like sit too long on this because I don't want it to kind of take over, but is with the not so nice memories, this is impactful as well, right? So sometimes people will ask or question, why did someone wait three years before they decided to share their, this, this, um, 
you know, abuse or neglect or something kind of on the negative side. And sometimes it's because they've kind of pushed to the back one of those emotions, right? So there was a case that I had been involved with where the um, victim was on a, we'll say a, a train or a bus. I'm not exactly, I don't exactly. And a person walked by who was not, was not the abuser, but had on the same cologne as her abuser. And that was that it was a very specific uh, cologne. And that was the trigger that she was missing. And so when she smelt that, it brought this memory to the forefront of her of her recollection, right? So it's important to realize that because there's um, certain things, and you'll think of this more the next couple of days, you'll be like, oh, I got really good smell, is certain smell, smell is a very powerful tool. And, um, and that a lot of times is a, uh, can be a trigger to a not so happy and also a happy memory, right? For example, they'll tell you when you're staging your house, if you've ever sold a house, they um, suggest you bake brownies or cookies or a pie or something like that. Because when people come in to visit your home, that generally will trigger a response of family time, family meals, and those elicit those happy, happy, joyful um, type of memories. All right. The last part of the brain to develop is the cerebral cortex. And this processes your conscious experiences. So this, when it's developing, process your abilities such as thinking, sensing, reasoning, and other conscious actions. So it's in the four to six most outermost layers of the brain. And when you see it, it's often, um, it's on the slide as kind of like this coral color or salmon. Um, but it's actually known as the gray matter because it, it lacks um, nerves and insulation. Okay. For the other, other parts of the brain. So now these are the four parts of the brain, brain stem, cerebellum. So the brain stem is your survival, right? Cerebellum is muscle coordination. Limbic system is your emotional epicenter. And then your cerebral cortex is your thinking processing center. Okay. So now the next part, that we're going to go into is the two hemispheres. So this is if you're standing up and you're looking down on your brain and you kind of divide it in half, right? You have a left hemisphere and you have a right hemisphere. And I'm sure you've all heard the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body, right side of the brain controls the left side of the body. There's a lot more to it, right? So the right side of the brain is responsible for, we'll put it in, in big picture, right? Any of the functions or the majority of the functions that happen in the left side of the brain and the right are duplicated in the right side of the brain. Some of them are a little more specific to each side of the brain. So the right side of the brain, as I said, is kind of big picture, right? So I'm going to kind of put it, we'll put it in this way, right? Everyone loves a party. We're getting ready for cookout season, right? Proms, christenings, graduations, all sorts of happy parties, right? So right side of the brain is invited to this party. They arrive, right? And when the right brain walks in the room, they're going to perceive the big picture of what's happening. They're going to recognize that the room's large. It might be noisy. It's going to be filled with people. The right hemisphere is big picture oriented. It relies and processes information based on symbols and images. And it's concerned with spatial perception, right? Now, 
we have to invite the left brain to the same party, okay? So the left brain comes to the same party, right? And when they walk into a room, they see a close friend on the other side of the room. They see a particular food that might be served. They notice how the place settings are. They notice, they can zero and they notice where the restroom is. So they are, the left brain focuses more on specific details, right? And the left and the right work together to process this information. But the left hemisphere uses logic and details to process a situation. It uses words, language, and objects to understand their world around them. And the left brain is based on order and patterns. And they use a lot of um, strategies and logic to process and make sense for them. Now, most of us, the left in the brain, left and the right, kind of talk to each other. They get along. We're all in the party together, right? Now, sometimes people may have more right brain or left brain tendencies. So I had to do something last Friday that is not my favorite thing to do. Everyone has to do it if you have an employment or job. Um, anybody want to take, it's a very left brain activity. Anybody want to take a guess what that was? You have to do it before April 15th. Taxes? Yep. Adriana, I saw you. I saw that. I know. I saw that. Even between behind the glasses and the mask, I saw that. Like, yep, she got it. <laughs> she got it. Taxes. All right. So every year I start out with my lovely accordion folder and I'm going to put my mileage. I'm going to put my receipts. I'm going to, you know, put everything I do in there. Great. That lasts about two months and then everything just goes in that miscellaneous folder in the back and then two days before i'm due to file my taxes my living room looks like something exploded and i have everything sorting out and i'm trying to remember where i put this one or that one or who did i donate to or what did i do and then i go see my accountant and i sit there and i always go on friday and he he knows he because he, he knows me he's been my account for a while and you cannot write off doggy daycare. I will let you know that. Okay. Just an FYI. Um, I tried. Is he starts talking about I, I anything tax related. And I try to focus. And I can't. And my brain starts thinking. Um, where am I going to go out to eat tonight? What am I going to? What am I going to order for food? Did I wear that black shirt last time I went out with my friend? Can I wear it again? You think she'll remember? And I'm just like, do, do, do. And then he's like, okay, Cheryl, so did you? And I'm like, snap back. And I'm like, yes, yes, I did. Did you want? He's like, you didn't even, I'm like, nope, did not hear a word that you said, right? I am taxes and that is very left-brained, right? I am and I know this about myself, I am very much a right brain. My mom would say, Shari, you can't see the forest through the trees. Never understood that. I'm like, okay, this tree's in a forest. You can't see the forest. Through the I don't, you know, it's the, do you look at your windshield or do you look through your windshield? One of those. I'm a, let's throw it out there, see if it sticks. My mother would say things like, um, you're always flying by the seat of your pants, right? That's, generally how right brainers get things done. Like I am your, you know, um, I worked for a large scale um, child care center. We had many, many different uh, locations, right? Branches. And someone, I was in charge of their professional development. So I'm like, you know, I on the prize. I want people to go back to school. I can see pomp and circumstances. I can see graduation, rah, rah, rah. And the owner would come to me and say, Cheryl, I want to do, and they'd have lovely paperwork and they'd put it down and they'd start explaining. And I'm like, okay, what's, what's the end goal here? What do you want? What do you want to end up with? And I'm like, all right, let's do it. 
let's do it. Or I give them something and I'm like, I think this is a great idea. I think we should do it. And they're like, do you have a, a project proposal? Do you have an analysis of outcomes? Do you have, and I'm like, no, but in my brain, this works, right? Like, why do you need all that stuff? Like it's in my brain and it works. I see people graduating, life is great. They're getting great jobs now. Like I can see that. So we need the two sides to talk to each other, right? We need to, I, I have to be able to, the IRS wants me to do my taxes. So I have to be able to pull from both sides, right? Now there's this lovely, anybody think just off what I had kind of um, told you, anybody think that they can clearly identify as either a left or right brain? Do you have to be one or the other? No, nope. Some, some people pull equally from both sides. Some pull from both sides as needed. So I can do my taxes. It's just not something I enjoy doing, right? But I know when I look at the forms that my accountant does, I know if he's like claiming a second house in like Aruba, I don't have a second house in Aruba, right? Because ultimately I'm responsible for my taxes. So he can prepare them. But if you get audited, you know who gets audited? Me, not him. So you have to be a like, so there's that aspect of it. So you do not have to be absolutely one or the other. Some people have more tendencies towards one or the other. Now, I will say as far as, um, organization goes, I am left brain. If I don't have a junk drawer in my house, right? So my junk drawer is organized. I have little bins in it, right? My closet is color coded, right? So I have black, tans. I'm a very neutral person. Um, and then I have short sleeve and long sleeve within those, right? So that, that I am left brain, but generally overall in life, I do have more, I'm more of a let's do it and see what happens person than being very um, calculated. And so when I started at Fisher, it works out really well. So we work, we do eight week courses. So every eight weeks I'm getting new students, right? And I embrace change. I love change. Only 2% of the population embrace change. And so for me, a job that's the same every single day. So if you think about it, early childhood, there's never, and if anyone says they have two days that are the same, they're they're blatantly lying to you, right? So there's, and you'll say there's never two days the same, right? So that's, that's a strong aspect of being uh, a little more right-brained. Anybody think they kind of go once one, one hemisphere more than the other? Oh, we have some more that joined. So in the chat, it seems as though right brains are winning out in this group. Um, All right. Those are my people. <laughs> Those are my people. Make sure you connect with me. Connect with me. Um, we're going to have fun at a party. I will tell you that. We are going to. We have to invite left brain because they're the ones that do those cute little like little charcuterie boards and food cups and stuff like that. Yeah, that's what we need. Those left brains. All right. Now. We have this little line that goes down the middle of the hemispheres called the corpus callosum, right? Think of this as, um, let's see, 95 at rush hour. This is an information superhighway, okay? So this is a band of fibers that connects the right and the left hemisphere of the brain. So this band of fibers enables the left and the right side of the brain to communicate to each other. It's present at birth, but it continues as the brain develops and the hemispheres become more increasingly specialized. The corpus callosum becomes more effective in processing the information between the hemispheres. This is going to be key, right? One person in this group is going to email me and ask me for more information. It always happens. I would bet money on it. All right. I'd bet my new shade of lipstick on it. 
the corpus callosum continues to mature during middle childhood. And it's crucial, crucial for balance and coordination. Stand on your left foot, balance on your right foot, right? So one key element that's co that's co related to the coordination of the corpus callosum is reaction time. So this is the amount of time it takes for you to uh, react to a stimuli or an event or whatever it is, right? So here's some stats. Every year of childhood, reaction time shortens by a few milliseconds, okay? So it, reaction time stabilizes in adolescence. So it's developing, 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 and then right around um, middle childhood adolescence is when it peaks, right? And then beginning at about age 20, it starts to revert, right? Now we're talking milliseconds. So don't want to stop freaking out yet, right? So we're talking because I'm, I'm approaching 55, right? So my reaction time. So it starts to revert. So now I'm going to give you a little scenario. Older adults, nobody has to raise their hand, between the ages of 60 to 81 are about as quick in their reaction time as eight-year-olds, okay? So think about this, right? So when there's a game, um, Jeopardy, right? Now, you have to buzz in, right? You got your buzzers, you ask questions, you got to buzz in, right? There's a reason why they have senior week. There's a reason why they have, you know, college week or are you smarter than a fifth grader, whatever it is. You could not have someone that's, you know, 20 with a senior, their reaction time to buzz in is going to be very different, right? When your grandparents or older adults that you know go to the DMV and they're like, you can't drive anymore. It's not because the DMV hates old people, right? It's because they're concerned for their reaction time, okay? So when someone in the age bracket of 60 to 81 approaches a red light or a stop sign, are they able to react quick enough so that it's safe for them and for others, right? So if anyone has played video games with younger children, right? Whatever game you're playing, you know, you gotta, you know, uh, maybe attack the guy that's behind, that's jumping out from behind the rock right? We're never going to see it as quickly as that six or eight year old that's playing the video game with us, right? But this is important because you know what happens? That little six or eight year old is going to find the person that jumps out behind and they're going to throw a rock at them, shoot them, whatever they have to do in this video game, right? And they win the game. They get the point. You know what that does? That creates a bonding moment with the adult that they're playing with, because then they're like, ha ha, neener, 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 I beat Grammy or I beat Nana, right? In the video game. And they they have that sense of, um, you can look at this with sports, right? The GOAT, Tom Brady. Yes, I am a New England person. Yes, I am originally from Massachusetts. So everyone, what were they talking about? He's too old, right? His reaction time isn't going to be the same for the for the snap and the toss, right? It's not going to be the same as a new college student that's coming in that's 21, 22, 24. He's 40. Like he should just, you know, so he was an anomaly to this, but that's what that's what we're looking at with reaction time. Right? Anybody have any questions on that? Was that interesting? I think it was. That was one, that and the limbic system. It's probably my favorite. It's an awareness because we have young children in our care. This super highway is not fully developed. Okay. So it's not pulling equally from the left and the right sides because it's still getting fine tuned, right? So you might have some children that want to sit at a table and play with um, like tabletop games or small manipulatives, and they will sit there for hours, right? 
you have other children that are movers and shakers, right? They're the ones that you're, you know, and you'll hear, can you please sit crisscross applesauce? This is quiet time. Sit crisscross applesauce. Look at this calendar. Don't even get me started on calendar time. We're not even going to talk about that. That would go down severe rabbit holes. So, but it's an awareness to an ability that the child has, not a disability, right? So for me, when I would go into a childcare center and you would say crisscross, we need to sit crisscross applesauce, that is almost a death sentence for me, right? That is very difficult for me to be able to do, right? So now as I've aged and we have to attend lovely things called meetings, um, I have to, I develop strategies so that I can sit in those longer meetings, right? Without like kind of losing, I might take a little bathroom break. I might make sure I have, you know, a glass of water so I can be doing something. I also have a, um, I have a spinner ring, like a fidget ring, right? That will keep me focused in those longer meetings because all I'm, I'm like, I just need to get up and get outside. Like I want to get up and I want to, I need to move my body, right? So it's an awareness for the children that you have that you are able to adjust activities to accommodate all of them, right? You know the children that are lining up and they're like beelining it outside, right? And even outside, outdoor activities, you have the children that are running around, they're big body, they need, they want to scream and yell. And then you have children that like to sit in a sandbox maybe and create lovely sculptures or, you know, sandcastles or just play with that fine that fine sand that you have, right? So and that's where it comes into play for your, that's where it can be impactful for your work is to know that um, they might not both be talking to each other. It's not to say that they're, they're not going to, it's just the corpus callosum, it's not fully developed yet, right? So one of the things that um, I'll tell you is, and you can write this down if you want. Expectations are the root of all heartache in anything you do, right? So a lot of times our expectations of what children can do are up here and what they're actually able to do is down here. And that's where a lot of your challenging behaviors come in is because we're expecting them to use their words. Don't hit your friends. You have to share. You need to sit crisscross applesauce when what they're able to do is not it's not there, right? So when you're planning, remember that corpus callosum. All right, now we're moving on. Um, let me just make sure, boop, 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 boop. Got all that. Right, now, so we have the four parts of the brain. We have the two hemispheres, corpus callosum included, now we have four lobes. So if you were to look at your brain and you cut it in half, right? Don't do this at home. Cut it in half. You have the left side of the brain, right side of the brain. Each side of the brain has the same four lobes. Okay. So they're duplicated. Each lobe of the brain has distinct functions. Here we go. Are you ready? The first one is the frontal lobe. Right here, right? It's located just behind the forehead. And the frontal lobe is the last part of the brain to finish developing. Anyone want to guess the age range that the frontal lobe is fully developed. Throw it in the chat. Take a guess. I think Kate has a distinct advantage over us. I will say that. 
she is excluded from answering it. Uh, she, Kate is spot on. It's generally about 23 to 25 is, um, is where we, where we land some, you'll see some research. It's more 26 to 30, but it's, it's generally a little bit lower. So I have, I have one daughter. She is, uh, 31. And when, uh, she was at home, I would say, Amanda, do you want to do that? And she's like, Hmm, not fully developed yet. And I'm like, go empty the dishwasher. It's developed enough for your arms to work to empty the dishwasher. Okay. So that range, 23, 28. This is why people in that age range, and I apologize if anyone on this group is in that age range, but here you go. Here's a little understanding is they, they take risks that we may not understand right? So the frontal lobe is, this is your thinking, reasoning, planning, decision-making, creativity, judgment, problem solving, all of that in that space, right? So this is why sometimes when they do something, like when my daughter will text me and she'll say, can you text me my social security number? I'm like, are you what? No, 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 can't do that. Um, and sometimes they'll make decisions and you're like, what were you thinking? They weren't. Okay. So I will also say it's an understanding, not an excuse. Okay. So there's also located within the frontal lobe is an area called BRCA, B-R-O-C-A. Okay. BRCA's area is responsible for the production of language. This is the language center of the brain. Okay. So if there, it's so Broca's area is responsible for the production or controls the production of spoken and written language. So if there's damage to that area, whether it's, you know, they fall off a bike, if it's um, in utero, however the accidental damage happens, it can prevent a person from producing language or it can cause speech imped impediments such as slow and slurred words or words that are not properly formed, okay? I will tell you, this is why it is vital. I think children should be born with helmets on and I don't think they should take them off until adolescence, okay? Because the damage that can happen right? To different parts of the brain is, it's just, it's, it's really severe. Also, you do not, it's my little public service announcement. You do not want to buy a used helmet. Okay. Because you don't know, it's just like you would not want to buy a used car seat. You don't know if that helmet has had any severe impacts. And after a while, um, the helmet, they, they should be, um, they should be replaced, right? So children are dropping them on the ground. They're throwing them. You want to make sure that they maintain what they were built for. And that's, it's to protect the, protect the skull. Okay. You can still get a concussion, but what you're trying to do is pr protect any direct impact um, outside of that. So just make sure you are inspecting your helmets and make sure they're still, um, they're fairly uh, put together. Also, the frontal lobe controls muscle movement necessary for the production of speech and swallowing. So much from that frontal lobe. All right, temporal lobe. This is the one when we go over something, I'm glad that I'm online so you guys can't slash my tires and I tell you something. But anything that I tell you is supported by research, okay? We'll make that little disclaimer before we get there. So the next lobe is the temporal lobe. The temporal lobe located over your ears and it's responsible for the ability to hear, to process and use language. Now, there's an area inside of the temporal lobe called, it's pronounced Vernicki. So it's W-E-R-N-I-C-K-E. Both sides have this area. 
And this plays a critical role in the ability to understand meaningful speech. Damage to this area can cause the loss of ability to understand language. So a person may be able to speak clearly, but the words that are put together won't make any sense. Okay. This area is responsible for receptive language. So we have frontal lobe is spoken, production of language. Temporal lobe is receptive. So what you receive, okay? Now, we have children that have had multiple ear infections. They are now putting tubes in children's ears earlier. What happens is everyone has fluid in their, in their ear canal, right? What happens in an ear infect is that fluid, it gets infected, right? And then they can't, they can't hear. It's kind of like if you put your head underwater. So if, if you look at the research, children that have had systemic multiple ear infections, right? Sometimes will have language delays. They're not hearing the language the same as everybody else, right? So um, that's that's a, an awareness that you should that you should be able to have um, also when you're you know developmentally screening these infants. Um, the other is there's something that we as a society are doing that um, kind of um it's having children produce language later in life and we need to become more aware and stop doing it anyone want to take a guess what it is so what we're there's something that we're doing as a society that is hindering the development of language anybody want to take a guess what that is Screen time, iPhones, iPads, good guesses. All right, for the sake of time, I'm going to tell you. Sippy cups. <gasps> Insert gasp awareness. Oh, my goodness. So what happens with a sippy cup is children, do you know they make car seats with sippy cup holders? My first car didn't even have a cup holder. I had to go to like job lot and buy one of those little plastic cup holders that sticks into the window. And when you would drive, you'd be like, please don't let it fall. Cause it was just like hanging there on the window. What my God, I had a roll down my window. Okay. So sippy cups are convenient for you, right? So when they... When children are using a sippy cup, whether there's a straw in it or whatever, you know, however it's set up, they're doing suck, swallow, suck, swallow. There's certain muscles that need to develop to be able to produce language, okay? And you need to gain that oral muscle control. And if children are not being able to take a cup and put it to your lips and take a little bit of fluid and swallow develops those oral muscles, right? And those oral muscles are beneficial because it helps children develop language, right? Now, this may not happen in every child, but it's an awareness for you. So in your care and in your practice is you can emphasize the, um, you know, I can go into a lot of developmental things, but using a cup, it's, you know, it's palmer grasp, it's eye-hand coordination, it's small muscle control, it's oral muscle control, it's building those oral muscles, which is, um, it's really important for the development of language. So the earlier that you can wean them off of sippy cups, the better, um, the more likely they will develop language a little bit earlier. Questions? One moment. Okay. So, and I know we're going fast. Let's see. Oh, I think we might have comments. Tongue retraction is required for all sounds in the room. Yes, she put it in very scientific. <laughs> Kate, great job. 
Now, screen time, iPhones, iPads, that's a whole other. We're kind of focusing on the um, um, the, the oral, oral control of muscles for language. Um, screen time, iPads, iPhones, that's another developmental context for, um, but the American Academy for Pediatrics has lots of research out on screen time, okay? Now the last, uh, second to last, the third part of the brain is the parietal lobe. It's located at the crown of the head. And this is responsible for the perception of touch, taste, and smell, okay? So this is also spatial perception and body orientation. Now you guys all do things that in tries to reinforce and develop the parietal lobe and you probably don't even realize it, right? So you're like, where's my nose? Where's my eyes? Show me your tongue. Where's your ears? This is all benefiting the parietal lobe, okay? Because you're strengthening that body orientation for children. So damage to the parietal lobe can cause difficulty telling left from right. Not, not left and right confusion, but really left and right difficulty. It can also cause impairment of writing and calculation abilities, difficulty recognizing body, difficulty with spatial perception, and then the also the inability to draw simple figures becomes difficult, okay? So we wanna try to reinforce this. This is when um, children are going to get examined to go to kindergarten, first grade, they'll ask you to do certain things, right? Um, stand on one foot. Stand on the other foot. Can you draw this figure? Can you do this? Um, so that um, those are all coming from the parietal lobe. And last but not least is the occipital lobe. So the occipital lobe is located in the back of the head. It's responsible for processing visual information. Okay. Anyone watch the eclipse yesterday? Went through the occipital lobe. The occipital lobes um, are responsible for processing visual information. Not only do they allow us to see and identify objects, but they also allow us to see colors and interpret that each color is different, okay? So when infants are born, they can see approximately, I'd say about like eight to 10 inches, right? And they don't, they see contrast colors, right? So you'll notice that a lot of infant toys might be red, black and white, um, very stark features. The, the distance, if you wanna try to gauge it, that an infant can see at birth is when you're holding an infant to nurse. That's about because, and this is important because that infant is locking gaze on the parent and they're building that strong bond and that connection, okay? And then as the child develops, their vision becomes more acute and it becomes more refined. So it doesn't matter what color you paint the nursery, the child can't see it anyways, not until they get a little bit older, okay? So save your money and um, just paint it in a neutral color. Now, the other thing is the occipital lobe is one of the most critical windows of opportunity that you have to be aware of. It's vitally important that you are doing tracking with objects, lock, it's seeing if children can lock on gaze, if any deficits are not identified before the age of two, it becomes harder for um, medicinal or doc doctors to be able to reverse or to correct it, right? So if you catch it prior to the age of two, hopefully they can intervene and they can try to repair it or do some remedial work. But after a certain age, that window of opportunity kind of closes. And that's why it's really important to make sure that you're having developmental screenings done on all your children and, and not just doing them once. And so this is, um, this is really important. There is a PBS spe special that goes into this a little more in detail. And let me, it's right here. The brain is wider than the sky. Well, the brain is bigger than the sky. It, start, it starts off with a really like 
creepy song like it's like weird like you wouldn't think it would fit but it's an infant laying in a crib and it goes the brain is wider than the sky and it goes very in depth into it but there is a great section on the occipital lobe and the importance of um having that screened so the other thing that um the occipital lobe does, does is it distinguishes between and interprets shapes okay so if a child I know we all love to practice letters and, you know, we have that lovely band that goes around the room that has all the letters. You want to start with shapes, right? If a child cannot recognize or has difficulty drawing their shapes, it's going to make writing the alphabet very difficult. If you look at our alphabet, what is it comprised of? Shapes. The letter A, triangle. Right. So when before you go straight to focusing on write your name, really make sure that children are able to recognize and draw their um, draw their shapes, triangle, circle, square, rectangle. Cheryl, oh. just a time check. We have three yep. minutes left. OK, I'm wrapping it up. All right. So if there's damage to the occipital lobe, it can cause uh, deficits in impaired vision or total vision loss. So these are the four parts of the lobe, all kind of wrapped up. Here's just a little impressions arriving at the brain, make it um, enter into activity, just as food falling onto the stomach excites it for more abundant juices. This is all part of the um, training. These are some of the references that um, I have throughout the slide that I've used. You can um, connect with me. I'm on all the social media things under Easy Ed to Go, LinkedIn. Please reach out to me. Um, and I do apologize for the, um, wrapping it up, but does anybody have any questions, thoughts? I thank you for all that you do for children, um, every day. I, I give you so much credit. I could not be back in the classroom right now. Um, I don't mind visiting. Um, but I, I thoroughly thank you for all you do. Um, I thank Kate for everything she does. She's a fabulous ambassador for the CDC for um, developmental screening. And please make sure that you are having children screened. Well, thank you so much, Cheryl. We really appreciate you volunteering your time.